So what was your job in, in Vietnam? Uh, initially assigned as a door gunner on the CH-47 helicopters, commonly known as the Chinooks. And what was the, so what was involved in that job? Uh, you flew as a door gunner uh, during flights on the left side of the helicopter with an M60 machine gun uh, and you know, protection of the uh, aircraft in that, on that side of the helicopter as a spotter on that. Yeah. So primarily, I mean, when you think of that job, it's primarily defense of the, of the Chinook helicopter that you were Yeah, on? Uh, defense of the helicopter, then also if, uh, if, uh, support, you know, in support of troops on the ground in case they need uh, cover to covering fire. So you would also, so then you've got troops on the ground in a firefight. Yeah, and, and if they request assistance, you know, need assistance, then you can uh, supply uh, support, yeah. Yeah, is, is that, so that's the, that's the main, that's the main job of the, of the door gunner, obviously. Yeah. But then there's also the, the term crew chief. Yeah. So is there, are there different tasks linked to being the crew chief? The crew chief uh, flew on the right side of the helicopter during the uh, flight as a door gunner and he was assistant maintenance of the uh, helicopter. And uh, then you had a fly engineer who took care of the loading and uh, the uh, uh, mechanics of uh, the helicopter. The crew chief was uh, responsible also for the maintenance on the helicopter. So when the helicopter's flying, the main job is defense of the helicopter and then it's also yeah. of the Chinook and then also uh, supporting ground troops. When it's on the ground, the job is primarily about maintenance. Maintenance, yes. Then. Okay. Um, in, a, in your year in Vietnam, in a typical week, how many missions might you fly? That would fluctuate uh, depending on the weather. Uh, sometimes if uh, it was bad weather, we may not fly that much mm. uh, because that determined you know, what you were going to do. If you can't see, you can't fly. Right. And uh, especially during the rainy season. Uh, then sometimes you had such low ceilings that uh, you were being in danger of ground fire because you like to fly between uh, 50 feet and uh, 1,500 feet because small arms fire. So uh, you, you needed that uh, s a safety area in there. Explain but that real quick. You wanted to fly between 50 and 1,500 feet because of small no, arms fire? No, you, wanted, you didn't want to fly within oh, the 50. Oh, you didn't want to fly within that range. Because you're susceptible to small arms fire. So Lower to the ground, you were faster. And they right. have, it to cut down on the reaction time right. to find you. Yeah. Unless they could see you from a, you know, a distance at an angle, right. at a height. But then at 1,500 feet, you're less susceptible to being hit by ground. They could shoot at you, but you're less susceptible. Right. With small arms fire, however, you know, they did have higher caliber weapons too. Yeah, so yeah. that's the range you want to stay out of. You want to stay out of it, yeah. So, but with low ceilings, that puts you, you'd have to go in low. You know, if you had 200 foot ceiling, unless it was an emergency, and then help was needed and supplies, yeah, uh, you, you would hold off. Because yeah. th that's putting you right in their, right in their range. Just guessing, um, about what percentage of flights uh, or missions you went on, about how many of those, um, or what percentage of those missions uh, resulted in your Chinook taking fire from the ground? Oh, the, sometimes we were shot at and didn't even know it. You, when you got hit, you knew it. But there, you know, uh, we were getting shot at and not even know it because you're on a noisy helicopter. Yeah. And, uh, only time during the day, if you knew it, was if you saw a tracer. If it didn't hit you, if you saw a tracer or you could see a flash. Because mm. the Chinook was one of the noisiest helicopters there were. And then sometimes, you know, ground troops would say, hey, you're, you're, you're getting shot at over here. Wow. You know? yeah. And that, but uh, I would say, as far as getting shot at, uh, we probably, knowingly, probably about maybe over a third of the missions that we, we yeah. were, yeah. So there were times where you could see the tracers coming up at you? Yeah, yeah if they screwed up and dumb enough to shoot a tracer, you, then they gave their position away. Other than that, the only thing you could do if you uh, saw a flash. Yeah. And that, yeah. but you're, you're going so fast there that the flash and you're gone, you know, mm -hmm. and that, or unless you, you see it at a distance as you're approaching. Yeah. You know. 
From the overall perspective of the war effort, what do you think was the most important thing about your job, the job you had? Uh, the provide the troops what they needed and get them where they needed to be and get them out from where they needed to be taken out. Uh, we, we were called a, a heavy lift. Uh, we, would, we could take in uh, 30 troops uh, with one lift, uh, or 45 Vietnamese troops. Uh, we could take in a... Uh, so 30 Americans, 45, just because mm -hmm. the Vietnamese tended to be smaller? Smaller. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we could take in uh, uh, a, a battery, or uh, artillery piece and their crew and their equipment at one time. Wow. We have their, the troops, the art, artillery uh, tube uh, crew on board. Then we would hover over, pick up their extra ammunition, and then also attached to that sling would be their artillery piece. Yeah. And we would bring wow. it up. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't unusual to also have a jeep with a trailer with their supplies inside the Chinook too with the yeah. crew. And then we're taking then we could take the whole crew and their supplies right in. So you're moving supplies, you're moving people, mm -hmm. uh, you're dropping off troops, you're bringing in jeeps, you're bringing in artillery. Uh, also food, 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 water, ammunition. Also, I imagine picking up casualties as well yeah. and bringing them yeah. back. So and moving yeah. prisoners too, if I remember. Oh yeah, we you have photographs of some of the prisoners that you moved. So. Yes. Yeah. And uh, you know the surprising thing about it when you look at them. They looked like young scared kids, like you know we were, mm. and uh, they were uh, you know, doing what their government asked them to do, and that was exactly what we were doing. Yeah. Uh, a lot of them were committed fighters, weren't they? Some were, yes. Uh, I would say some of them were more committed than a lot of the South, more than some of the South Vietnamese. Oh, so were. you're talking about that? I was I was thinking of the the Viet Cong and the NVA, but. Yeah. But some in the South Vietnamese, I mean, that's a little more complicated, right? Some yeah. of those guys were... Yeah. I would say your North, Viet yeah. your North Vietnamese were more dedicated than your, some of your uh, Viet Cong. Yeah. yeah. Because your Viet Cong were regional. And the North, Vietnam, or the North Vietnamese Army, they were coming in from the North having no, uh, or no connection with the South Vietnamese other than their, uh, co their cultures. Mm -hmm. About how many times would you have Viet Cong or North Vietnamese prisoners on the on the Chinook? Oh, uh, we probably did about uh, I'd say about twenty-five transports of prisoners. Wow! Yeah, yeah that's interesting. Yeah. Did you ever try to communicate with them in any way? No. You just let it go. Just let it go. Yeah. No, yeah. Normally, they are always they had uh, uh, guards with them and that. And uh, you'd be surprised how many women we transported to as prisoners. Viet Cong? Viet Cong, yeah. Wow. And some North Vietnamese. North, North Vietnamese troops had women coming down with them. They, yeah. they were nurses and other, right. other things yeah. and that, you know. Right. So they had them with them. Yeah. But, uh, and then, you know, sometimes we had to bring, we were the, the first leg in uh, taking, you know, with respect, some of the troops back for their journey home, and mm. that was the sadder part of it. Yeah, bringing back the, the, the dead. KIA as the killed in action. The dead, yeah. We were the first step in getting them home. I imagine I asked you the earlier question about, you know, the, the importance of your job in relation to the war. I imagine that was probably the hardest part of the job. Yeah. yeah. It, uh, and then when you had to bring some of your own people back, you know. Mm -hmm. that was people that you knew. People you knew, and, you yeah. know, and sometimes you take people in and then as far as the infantry, you take them in, and then, you know, within a day or so, you're going in, bring them back out. Yeah. And, wow. yeah. That's tough. Having not to live, you know, not having to live what they just lived through, you know. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it was an experience. Yeah. Vietnam veterans often, of course, talk about the, you know, the challenges of facing the enemy in country, uh, and they also, often talk about the challenges of the weather and the environment. When you think about being in Vietnam, what were some of the challenges that you had to deal with aside from the enemy? Well, the weather. And then also uh, we had uh, uh, 
critters, I guess, you, for <laughs> lack of a better term, that uh, we had to put up with the snakes and the rats. And uh, being in an aviation outfit, normally, you know, we uh, we didn't have we didn't have to go through what the guys in the field had to go yeah. through. They were exposed to a lot more of the critters than the we leeches were. Leeches, the leeches, mosquitoes, and the, and the ants. red ants. Well, we were exposed to the mosquitoes, but. Uh, right. uh, but uh, we, you know, the uh, uh, all kinds of, and even large uh, cats, they, you know, they had to be exposed that they were exposed to. And there's mm -hmm. been incidents where the lar large cats were tracking them on some of their uh, the long range reconnaissance wow. patrols, sure. and uh, the uh, like when. Uh, you know, with us around our living quarters, we had, uh, you know, rats were a constant companion, basically. Because uh, where there's GIs, there's food, and the sure. GIs really don't maintain the stuff. And we had, you know, food in our lockers and stuff, in uh, our foot lockers and that. Yeah. But anyway, they would nest in our uh, sandbags and around our living quarters mm -hmm. and uh, in our uh, sandbags and our uh, bunker areas and mm -hmm. our, uh, they would nest in that and uh, it wasn't uncommon to have, have a uh, rat pay you a visit uh, during the night or crawl across you or uh, that yeah. or you could hear them. And, yeah. uh, and out but, in the field you've got cobras and pythons. And, yeah, and you even had s some of those around your living quarters too, which I mean some of you, they kill the rats. So that, that, yeah. was, that was a good thing, some of them, but still yeah. You know, if, if uh, they were going to kill the rats, it's like, okay, what are they going to do to me if they bite me or something, you know, yeah, which I, yeah, yeah, what, yeah. that was a constant thing to worry about. Yeah, and you mentioned the weather at the, at the outset in Vietnam vets. I often talk about the weather. How would you characterize the weather in Vietnam? Well, it seemed like you uh, uh, were wet from the time you got there basically till the time you left because in the summer you're sweating. The heat is... Uh, it's atrocious, and you're sweating, you're wet, and uh, you've got the stink that you have to put up with, uh, uh, you know, because mm. it's a smell. And because, because the guys are sweating all the time. And well, not and al all the time. also, you know, if you're around an area where there's a, a lot of foliage, you know, the rotting of uh, the foliage mm. and that, and also around the. Uh, villages and stuff you have uh, they use human waste and animal waste to air you know to fertilize mm -hmm. their crops and that oh so boy. but you had you know you had the smell and like in being an aircraft and that you know you had fuel you, you mm -hmm. had to had to put up with and that mm -hmm. and if uh, one of the things about being in a helicopter you, you sometimes you get a good breeze to air out you know <laughs> you're flying along getting a good breeze mm -hmm. but it seemed like you were Wet, it's you know, wet all the time. during the hot season, and then uh, hot and dry, and then during the wet season, you were wet, and you were wet to the point where you're. I mean, temperature might be in the 70s, but you're still chilly because you were used to the weather being hot. Mm -hmm. You know, Anything previously. rained on constantly. Uh, it, it, yeah, basically, it was. You know, it might lighten up a little bit, but yeah, you're you're. So, sometimes the rain was so hard it was going sideways. Yeah. And that, but where you know, you can't uh, work on your helicopter during during the rain, and, you know anything going on. You can work on stuff inside of it, but I mean, other than that, you're not going to get on uh, any of the exterior components to mm -hmm. work on, and it's, unless it's absolutely necessary. But you know, w water can get in components that it shouldn't get into. So, but uh, it was. It was pretty bad. Mm -hmm. and we we couldn't fly missions because of the weather and support of the troops, unless it was a dire emergency and there's some way we could get into it. Did that it. bother you sometimes? Because I mean, on the one hand, it means you don't have to go out on a mission, but on the on the other hand, there are the guys out in the field who are living in the elements all the time. Um, I mean, did you think about that at all? That you know, in some ways. You know, I've got it kind of good compared to the guys out in the field. Or yeah. Did you ever think about it that way? We, we did have it better. I mean, you know, I'm not yeah. going to deny that. Uh, we, we were getting wet, too, but not to the extent the way those, those uh, guys who I admire, they, they were having to live in it. And, uh, yeah. uh, you know, you try to 
if they needed something, you'd try like crazy to get it to them because yeah. you, you knew what they were going through and if they needed it and if they had, needed to get out, you'd do anything in the world to get them out of there, you know, where they were at. Yeah, I mean, so sometimes there was that, you know, like if the word comes that we can't fly because of the weather, was sometimes your response almost one of disappointment because you really wanted to get out there and get that stuff to the guys who, who needed it? <laughs> yeah, sometimes, there. but then sometimes you kind of threw that to the to the wind and you flew by sound if you could. You, you went know, anyway. okay, Yeah, okay, can you hear us? Yeah. How close do we sound? You know, the only time you had a, if, if the only time you had a problem would be in mountain areas and you, you, you could fly right into the mountain. Mm -hmm. But if you were in flat areas and stuff, okay, can you hear us? Yeah. Well, where does it sound like we are, you know? Sure. And that, and sometimes, you know, we, we flew very, very infrequently, but we did fly missions that way. Yeah, even if the weather was tough. And, and then the Air Force came in and some of our small, our larger uh, landing zones uh, set up some radar so they could, they could pick us up and fly us in by uh, radar. You know, so it would limit the number of aircraft that could be flying at the time because of the limit that they, they could you know, uh, safely handle. Mm -hmm. But uh, that helped out. And especially like when we were near, like I said, Phuket, where the Air Force was there in Central Highlands, uh, you know, they had radar and that's so we could use, you know, they could, uh, uh, we could use them to yeah. navigate us around too. So, I mean, sometimes the weather would be bad, but you could still get the stuff, you know, still get, you know, yeah. the, the birds in the air and, yeah. and get the supplies to the guys that needed yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 it would depend on the priority, I mean, the urgency in that. Sure. Yeah. You, yeah. you throw the rest of the wind. In the Aishaw Valley, this is during Operation uh, Delaware in uh, April 1968. Uh, the Aishaw Valley had been uh, taken over by the North Vietnamese in March of 1966 and was part of uh, the valley was part of the Ho Chi Minh Trail that uh, the network coming down from uh, North Vietnam down through Laos and uh, South Vietnam and was a main thoroughfare there and mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the first cab uh, with uh, working uh, companion with the 101st Airborne who was part of the operation doing their own segment of it. They were coming in, uh, into the valley from the southern portion and then the, the first cab, uh, the northern portion. And uh, we went into the valley. And during that first day of uh, Operation uh, Delaware, there was a lot of aircraft lost in, in that valley. Uh, we had to come down through uh, holes in the cloud because of the weather conditions. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, clouded over the valley. You couldn't see it from the high altitude. So we were looking for holes in the clouds and coming down through it. Well, this was the first time we'd ever been exposed to anti-aircraft fire. And mm -hmm. it was a 37 millimeter uh, uh, anti-aircraft. And it's like what you would see in a World War II movie. Mm -hmm. And they knew we were coming, where we would be coming down through after they saw a few helicopters come down through those holes. And so they could spot, and plus some of them were radar controlled. Oh, yeah. And plus they had uh, higher caliber weapons too in that valley. They, they, were, they had a good air defense system set up there. Mm. And uh, I don't think that uh, intelligence told uh, our uh, higher ups, the ex extent, or if they even knew the extent of the anti-aircraft weapons in that valley. So we lost a lot of uh, aircraft on that first day, and this is one of them that was lost this putting in this, uh, this uh, la uh, landing zone. And there are troops there who are uh, there to protect that landing zone. As you can see, there are uh, some of their uh, living quarters there so that's been set up to protect yeah. them from the weather. So they now they're there to protect the landing zone and also to pre prevent the NVA from taking anything Ta from the helicopter. And that's well, the, that's that's a main supply point. They operate out of that landing zone. Okay. There's uh, troops there, and they operate uh, doing uh, search missions and okay. uh, out of there and patrolling in that area. So they have to maintain control of that that landing zone. So the the, the trees were cut down then by U.S. forces to make a well, landing zone. Uh, the majority of those trees were uh, the 
bombed. They came in and bombed uh, the flat and the, as flat like as you that. can. Yeah, okay. And then uh, the uh, w when the first troops are going in, they took engineers in with them with chainsaws and explosives, C4 explosives, and they uh, would okay. the engineers would uh, cut down what trees they could, or that then they would. Uh, also take explosives and take the trees out that way too. I see. So this this was this was the result of intentional U.S. bombing to mm -hmm. help make the make yeah. the landing. Yeah, and, and the work of the engineers too. Yeah. Okay. Do you know how long it had been since that helicopter had been shot down? I would say that was probably within uh, probably two or three days. Yeah. yeah. Well, here's a it's a. A strange question, maybe, but um, you know, for one who's never experienced anything, you know, like battle, uh, just go at the question any way you want. But you know, what is it like to be in battle? I mean, you're on your helicopter, you're shooting at them, they're shooting at you. Um, I mean, how would you describe that experience to someone who's never experienced anything like it? In a little, some ways, uh, I'll compare it to a sporting event. You know, like in football, you know, you're you're ready and primed and stuff, and then once that first hit takes place or whatever, you know, you're reacting. And to me, I, I didn't have time to really think. Right. I mean, you know, you had you had to do what you had to do, and uh, it was with us. It you know, it could be a 10 second, 15 second fire, you know, we're mo moving through the area, taking hits, returning fire, or we'd be covering somebody, in which would be a longer duration. But uh, it, you're, you're just reacting. You're running on survival, but that survival is like I say, in, in, like in a football game. Mm -hmm. And you're just concentrating and working. To, to so the guys mission. on the ground, a lot of the guys on the ground will get into you know, extended firefights yeah. or running firefights, something like that. Did you ever have an experience of something that was extended or in your job was, were they usually, you know, since you're on the move a lot, um, you know, did, I, I know you had a lot of, uh, a lot of, you got into a lot of firefights. It sounds like, you know, some would be very brief. Did you ever get into a firefight that did go on for some, some time? You know, more than several minutes, something like that? Not really. No, oh, okay. being in the air, you know, you're, right. you're there. And then uh, the uh, gunships would roll in, then you have the Air Force come in and take over, and mm -hmm. you have your forward air control uh, come in. So the, those were the ones who were going to handle it. You know, we would, we would provide support in that until they arrived. And, so, and if you had a helicopter go down, we'd provide support for that too. And if we went down, we knew they would be above us too. Yeah, and, uh, and you you were on some helicopters that were shot yeah, down. Yeah, it, was it three? three? Three helicopters shot down. But in each case, when you were shot down, did you come under fire? Yeah. When you were shot down, so in that were you um, were yeah. you able to still operate yeah. your, your weapon? Yeah, and then w but um, yeah, we were within an area. Of we had good support in that coming in, and we, yeah, and and got and out that, pretty. Quick. Got out pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the guys on the ground, I mean, they'll, you know, I don't, they'll talk about how adrenaline kicks in and, you know, that can only go for so long, right? Oh, but, yeah, yeah. But for you, I mean, was it sort of, you know, you have these brief interactions, just kind of adrenaline jolts, or how did that work? Well, uh, you know, there's the, that old saying, 90% boredom, 10% uh, terror. Uh, yeah, yeah, adrenaline rush. Yeah. And that, and then after it's over, it's kind of like, whew, yeah. that just happened, you know. And then, uh, mm -hmm. you, living through it yourself, you know these guys that are coming back in. As far as air crews, you know what they went through. So mm -hmm. I mean, you kind of go down, hey, how you doing? You know, yeah, yeah. yeah you know, kind of, yeah. you know. And if they wanted to talk about it, you talked about it, or you joke about it, you know. Mm -hmm. But the only time you did was when you lost somebody, and uh, sure. and then yeah, that wasn't That's a joke, that yeah. or somebody was wounded, yeah. and that. But I mean, other than that, you try to make light heart of it, and that. And I'd have to admire those men who went through those lengthy ex you know, exposures to it, because you know they 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 were really down there fighting for their lives, 
and as far as their emotions that they went through, I, I, I can't testify to that. It's just a very different thing. Yeah, yeah. but you know, our, our exposure was, uh, you know, like I say, it, it might be 10 seconds, five seconds, and sometimes it might be four or five minutes or longer, you know, as we're providing support. Mm -hmm. And our, you know, sometimes we were put in a situation where recovering an aircraft that had been shot down and that sometimes that we would have to, uh, you know, you're, you're sitting there on uh, 600, 800 gallons of uh, aviation fuel and mm -hmm. uh, the right hit, you're, you're gonna go down and burn. Yeah, and yeah. so you, you know you had that going through your mind too. But if it happens, it happens. Right. But uh, uh, we uh, we lived through it. A lot of us lived through it. Sometimes go back and it's like, okay, I remember there. I, you know, it's like uh, it's like anything in life. You have these snapshot pictures, and it's as clear as day in this picture. And they have these events that you remember happen, I mean, to the second, I mean, you remember everything. Mm -hmm. Then there's some like, okay, something happened over here and I can't remember exactly what that was. Yeah. But you have these little split seconds, it's like in your life. Yeah. And uh, it's one of those ones that, yeah, I, I, yeah, quite honestly, it's like, I would like to go through and live that again. It's like, it's like going through high school. Mm -hmm. I like to go back and redo that or, you know, I would like to go back and redo that again. And uh, that, that you're saying you you would like to go back and redo it again? Yeah. Really? I'd like. Yeah. It's part of your life, and it's like I don't know how many people think that way. But that's just that's just me. Sure. I'd like to go back. And just why? It's the camaraderie, mm. the brotherhood that you have, mm. and the the you know it's. We were a tight knit group, yeah. and uh, we we lived together, we ate together, we fought together, we bled together, and it's a feeling that you know you very seldom ever have in life. I've heard a combat veteran say before, you know, in the in the world of war, you know, the questions that come up are really simple, like, um, you know, what do I need to do today? Not, not necessarily simple in execution, but the, the questions are easy to ask and, and you know, uh, the answer is pretty straightforward. You know, what, what do I need to do today to do everything I can to get myself home and to get the guy next to me home? It's a really intense question. It's a really important question. And then you come back, you know, to the world and there's all sorts of stuff that comes up that just doesn't seem that it's taking your time, but it it's doesn't not that seem important. that important. It's yeah, not I think important. that's what yeah. I'm getting yeah. at. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in the uh, world of war, hey, everything yeah, is important. Is that really important, you know, yeah. in coming back? But you've got some people who didn't come, brought it home with them. Uh, fortunately, I didn't. And I know, you know there are some people who did. And they brought it home with them. And, uh, live with it and uh, live with the in their own minds in their own minds yeah, and, the yeah, and the that and uh, yeah. it caused issues and uh, sure. but I, w I was one of those ones that when I you know, left there I left there I did have some feelings like I say of reenlisting going back because mm -hmm. you know you're coming back into a situation you hadn't been in in a year here I was a week before and you know, flying missions and being shot at and that and now within that week I'm sitting at home with my family who I hadn't seen in a year but I've got my buddies over there mm -hmm. well, what's happening to my buddies that I live with, yeah. bled with fought with, shared everything with, what, what are they going through right now Yeah. but then that, that passed you know, after a while And but I did have uh, feelings of wanting to go back, you know, re-enlist and go back. And that's because, in a way, what was going on back in Vietnam seemed more important and more real? Yeah, that was my was life. Yeah, that, yeah. I mean, it, you know, it was put, it was something deep that you'd lived with for a year. And it's a stronger bond, the uh, fr friendship and dedication that you have. There. Yeah. Then here you're coming back. I'm going back into uh, driving a forklift in the steel mills, 
Uh, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> was, what was I doing? Yeah, there? it just doesn't seem, yeah. it certainly doesn't have the intensity, and it just doesn't seem as, uh, as big as um, getting on a Chinook and getting supplies out to guys out in the field who need it. Right. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. you know, like I say, after a while, you know, went back and started getting my relationships back with friends, and I have friends coming back from there, so we connected again and that. Yeah. So, but so, but it took a little bit, but yeah, things returned to normal. Yeah. And I'm one of the fortunate ones I didn't didn't have issues with it. With PTSD and things. Then, like yeah, I never had an no. issue with it. Yeah. And uh, I think that one of the things that may have helped me in my later years is being able to talk about it, where I, you know, I did put it away. Yeah. And uh, even with my friends who had been there, we we didn't talk about it. No. But you do find it useful to talk about it. Uh, yeah, I find it useful now. And to let people know. Sure. You know, because when we did come home, you know, uh, we, we weren't recognized or acknowledged by a lot of people. My friends, my family, yeah. But I, you know, I didn't go through the situation of being called a baby killer or... You didn't and, and, that. Yeah, or spit on or anything. I didn't go through it. I didn't see it. Uh, I don't know any of my friends who did, but I didn't have to go through that. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, but. So in that respect, you're fortunate. Uh, I was fortunate, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is taken in the Ashaw Valley, which was uh, to the west and southwest of uh, Way in uh, northern i uh, This is during Operation Delaware where we went into the Ashaw Valley, which hadn't been occupied by American forces since March 1966. Uh, this is a C-130 doing an airdrop that was a method of supply because of uh, the airstrip they were trying to put in wasn't completed at that time. Uh, and that, that was the basic method of uh, supply and uh, the Air Force guys did a terrific job in that they were Mm. They flew missions like crazy in providing uh, uh, armed support as far as the fighter, fighter jets and that, and also in, in supplying. And not long after uh, this picture was taken, there was a C-130 shot down doing the same, uh, doing the same thing, the same thing and uh, loss of eight crew members uh, yeah. in that. But... Uh, now, the, I'm sorry, go ahead. Not, well, uh, uh, the... Uh, you can tell by the terrain there that uh, you see uh, bomb craters there to the uh, lower left mm -hmm. and not too far from there. This, this valley had been uh, held by the North Vietnamese, the sole occupants of it, like I say, since 1966, and there were a wow. number of uh, B-52 drops in there, and you can tell this crater's from them. Yeah. yeah. Now those, the, the airdrop is, that's, those are supplies going down to U.S. troops? Yes. There. Yes. Now, so, so we know that there are U.S. troops down there, but then looking at the photo, I think we also see uh, the result of Agent Orange. Right, yeah. Right? So the tell us what Agent Orange was. Agent Orange was a uh, herbicide defoliant that was used in uh, Vietnam. It, it had previously been used by, the, I believe, the British uh, during their... Uh, Fights and war with, in the, I think Malaysia and yeah. that in yeah, the early in the fifties, yeah. and so the American uh, higher ups thought, well, they used it there with success, I guess. So we'll try it. We'll use it in uh, Vietnam, and what it does, it uh, kills uh, the uh, plants, trees, and that in the areas where the uh, North Vietnamese Viet Cong could hide. And they started using it in 1962, and his mm. uh, operation uh, Ranch Hand was how it started. When they started using it, using it, yeah, they were yeah. Uh, spraying it from tree, uh, from uh, uh, I think it's C-123s where they started out, and then even and, and, you know, we sprayed from helicopters, transported in helicopters. Did your so. did did, you, uh, did the helicopter you were on ever? We transported it you transported and then sprayed. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, from there, you, you know, uh, the Navy would go along the canals and spray it with hoses off the boats and stuff to yeah. kill the foliage along the rivers. 
And so the, 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 the purpose of Agent Orange was to basically kill the foliage so the enemy couldn't hide behind it because mm -hmm. right. it was a guerrilla style war and so there were a lot of ambushes. It makes perfect sense why they would want to do that, right? But as we go back to the, go back to the photo, we, um, we, we see that there are U.S. troops down there, they're having supplies dropped to them and they're in an area that has been significantly defoliated. Several times, yeah. Several times. And so probably some of those guys who are still alive are dealing with some of the, uh, the consequences of, of Agent Orange. Right. Uh, and unfortunately some who didn't survive the effects of, that, of the Agent Orange have already passed. Yeah, what have, what have some of the effects of Agent Orange been? Uh, there are several uh, forms of cancer that have been identified uh, and uh, approved as uh, are acknowledged as uh, effect from Agent Orange exposure, uh, and that list keeps growing. And there are other defects, or physical defects, which can do it. You know, medical defects uh, that have been accepted as caused by those exposed yeah. to Agent Orange. Now, this includes yourself, right? You've right. been diagnosed with something related to Agent Orange, right? So. What is that? Uh, multiple myeloma, and uh, I have a rare form of cancer that's a combination of multiple myeloma and uh, B-cell uh, Hodgkin's non-Hodgkin's uh, non, uh, non lymphoma, and uh, it's Waldstrom's, w Waldstrom's uh, cancer, yeah. mi microchondrial cancer. It's a rare form, and uh, that's what I have. And that's been definitely linked to Agent Orange. Right. Yeah. At the time, you know, even when you, to go back to the photo, even when you, you know, took this photo, at the time, did you have any thoughts about, I mean, in, in a way, using this stuff is obviously a good idea. It probably oh, yeah. saved a lot of lives in the immediate term. Yeah. Because, you know, the enemy have fewer places to hide. Was that the only, the only thing you noticed or... Do you recall there ever being a thought that went through your back, that went through the back of your mind, saying, "Gosh, but never thought about it." No, Our, yeah. you know, the you know, the proved by the government, they did it. You know, they yeah. approved uh, this method and that, but then it started being noticed by people returning home and their families. Yeah, high risk of, uh, our, our high high rate of cancers, birth defects, yeah. and that. And uh, you know uh, other illnesses, and but you know, the chemical companies wouldn't acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. you know, no, no, you know, and the government, no, no, you sure. know. But finally, after you know, like the VFW, American Legion, uh, uh, lobbying for it, and you know, individual uh, servicemen and their families, and then finally, with court cases and that, uh, and. Finally, the Congress said, hey, we have to accept responsibility for what sure, these people have gone yeah. through. So it, 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 it helped with, you know, it, it addressed a very real problem at the time, but then continues to have legacies. I mean, here we are, 50 years past your time in the war, and you're still living with the legacy of it. Well, it's, it's one of those situations that uh, they say that some died in Vietnam. Some, some brought something home from Vietnam that's going to cause their death anyway. Mm. And it's one, you know, one of those situations. But uh, yeah. fortunately, in my case, it's uh, under control. And yeah. uh, I'm very fortunate. But I have friends who aren't, aren't as fortunate. But yeah. the other thing is some died, my friends died, before the government even acknowledged. So they didn't benefit from the medical care that they could have gotten because of the denial and right. also their, what their family had to go through, both financially and mentally, because what yeah. they went through, and some of it was very hard.